All right, so I'm just testing the sound. We say something? Say something. Welcome to the Afford Anything podcast. This is the podcast formerly known as The Money Show, but it's not just about money. It's about living a more fulfilled life. You can afford anything, but not everything. So what's important to you? What really matters? I've gotten feedback that I should just get to the interview as fast as I can. So if you'd like to hear more about what this show has in store, stay tuned to the end of the episode when I give a backstage state of the show report. Today's episode is about the unbelievable power of simplicity, especially around your investments. Today's guest is Jim Collins. You may know him as the blogger J.L. Collins. He's been financially independent since 1989. I hate to say it, but that's almost as long as I've been alive. And Jim reached financial independence in the simplest way possible. First, he avoided debt and saved half of his income. Some people see this as deprivation. I suggest that instead of deprivation, when you're saving and investing money, you think of it as just a different way to spend. But instead of spending it on a new car or a fancier house or a new wardrobe, you're choosing to spend it on your freedom. Then, with those savings, Jim invested in index funds. That's it. In this episode, Jim describes his investing philosophy, and it's unusual. Well, you're right. My thinking on this runs counter to the vast majority of people who talk about this stuff, and I don't know, maybe even everybody. Jim says that most people don't want to spend every waking moment thinking about their investments. Most people want to manage their money so that they can move on with their lives and do things that they really care about. Most people don't want to think about this stuff all the time. Most people want to get on with curing diseases and building bridges and writing peace treaties and and much more interesting things. And that's why he says simpler is better. To maximize the simplicity of his investments, Jim only holds three index funds. He holds one that covers the whole U.S. stock market, one that covers the whole U.S. bond market, and one that's the equivalent of cash. And, you know, he says that even three is too many. He says you could get by with just one. Get one that covers the entire U.S. stock market and... That's it. You're done. Go home. Kick your feet up on the couch. That's all there is to it. So let's hear Jim describe this unusually simple investment approach. And remember, stay tuned for a backstage report at the end of this episode. Hey there. Finally. I know, right? (laughs) (laughs) You don't know when it's such a big honor to talk to you, how one waits with bated breath. Oh, you flatter me. (laughs) It's nothing less than you deserve. So how are you this morning? I'm good. How are you doing? Not too bad for an old guy. (laughs) So I I don't know, are we recording now or how is this going to work? I mean, I've listened to your podcast and it sounds like sometimes you start recording before anybody really knows. So I'm a little nervous. (laughs) And I assume we're not going to go with cameras. We're going to just... Oh, God, no. Oh. There's no way I would, like, even think about lighting and hair and makeup and... Uh, sounds like such a pain. Yeah, I didn't want to put on makeup this morning either. But I do look better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to be talking to you because you have a very famous stock series on your blog. Can you tell the listeners, what does the stock series cover broadly? What does it talk about? Well, basically, it's, it's how to invest to ultimately achieve financial independence. And it's written for people who really aren't interested in this whole investing thing. Mm-hmm. Basically, it's written for my daughter. I think knowing how to manage your money and invest it is an incredibly powerful tool to navigating this modern world of ours and to ultimately having the maximum freedom that we can have in, in this modern world. And so from when she was very little, I, I've tried to, to show my, my daughter some of these principles and lessons, but it's just not something that she's interested in. And at one point she was home from college and I started one of my many lectures and she stopped me and she said, you know, dad, I know this is important. I get that, 
but I just don't want to have to think about it all the time. And that was an epiphany for me because I suddenly sat back and realized that I'm the odd one out. You and I, Paul, are the odd ones out. You know, most people don't want to think about this stuff all the time. Most people want to get on with curing diseases and building bridges and writing peace treaties and, and much more interesting things. But the smart ones know they have to have some kind of handle on their money. And so the objective of my blog and my stock series and now uh, the book is to give people the tools they need with as little a time commitment from them as possible. Mm. And the good news is the great irony of investing is the simpler approach you use, the more powerful results you get. So here, here's a way to think about it. Imagine that you and I are sitting down at this huge banquet table. Okay. And on this table, this table is absolutely laden with every delicacy of food and drink from around the world you could possibly imagine. And incredibly complex in their preparation and flavors and, and what have you. And now think of that in terms of, of that banquet table, those foods instead of food and drink, all of the different things you could be investing your money in, all the different investment products. And they are almost endless and almost endlessly complex because that's how Wall Street makes their money, is selling complex investments to, to whoever. I'm going to sit down at that table, I'm going to put my arm on it, and I am going to sweep all of that onto the floor hmm. because we don't need it. And left when I'm done on one tiny little corner will be the only investments that we really need. Let's go into the stock series. Let's dive in. And I noticed that it begins with a post that's called The Market is Crashing. I'm assuming <laughs> that's because one of the most common objections you hear is, what if I put all my money in the market and it crashes? One of the principles that you need to understand if you're going to invest in stocks is that it is a long-term gain. Mm -hmm. And the stock market fluctuates. The stock market is volatile. If you look at, at a chart of the stock market's long-term performance, if you look at it over 100 years, you're going to notice two very important things. One is that it always goes up. Mm -hmm. It is higher today than it, than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. The market has an upward bias, and there are some key reasons why this is true that we can talk about. Mm -hmm. But the other thing you notice is, is that it is not a smooth ride. It's an incredibly volatile ride. Mm -hmm. And most people aren't prepared for that volatility. And what exacerbates that problem is that when the market drops the news media goes into an absolute frenzy. Right. Um, there was, I think, last fall or maybe the fall before, sometimes I forget, a 10% correction in the market. 10% mm -hmm. is perfectly common, even healthy, mm -hmm. for the stock market to periodically drop 10%. Well, one of the great headlines, and I wrote a post about this, was bloodbath on Wall Street. <laughs> and I'm like, bloodbath? I mean... This is a perfectly normal thing. I tell my daughter, uh, who is in her early 20s and is hopefully going to be investing for eight, the next 80 years, mm -hmm. she can expect market corrections, which are defined as about a 10% drop, routinely. These are routine things. She can expect bear markets, which is defined as about a 20% drop, on a regular basis. Uh, she can expect in the course of her nice long lifetime two, maybe three market crashes like we had in uh, 2008, 2009. The important thing is this is a normal part of the process. Mm -hmm. This is how markets behave as they relentlessly over time march upward. Mm -hmm. So the question then becomes, well, what do you do about it? And the thing that you do about it is nothing. Nobody can predict when these things are going to happen, even though the media is filled with people mm -hmm. predicting exactly that. Mm -hmm. The truth is nobody successfully, reliably can predict when this is going to happen. So you need to accept that it's a natural part of the process. You need to invest for the long term and not panic when everybody else panics. And how long is long term? Six months? <laughs> Six years? So that's a great question, and it's a little bit of a moving target. 
Uh, six months, I think we can categorically say is short term. Right. 20 years, we can categorically say is long term. Mm -hmm. Where the question comes in and most practically is, is I'll get questions on the blog where people will say, you know, I, I want to buy a house in the next five years and I'm saving my down payment and, and I want to invest in, in the stock market and make these great returns you're talking about. Well, the answer is that if you're going to be using your money in the next five years or less, the stock market is not where you want to be. Right. Uh, I don't know where the market's going to be tomorrow. I don't even know what it's doing today. I don't know where it's what it's going to do next week, next month. I don't know what it's going to do the rest of this year or next year. Five years out, there's a pretty good chance it's going to be higher than it is today, but not entirely. You go out 10 years, it's a very rare 10 year, very, very rare 10 year period where the market's not higher than it was 10 years earlier. You go out 20 years, I think there's one time in history history being the last 120 years or so, I think there's one time on the heels of the Great Depression where it wasn't higher after 20 years. So the further you go out, the more reliably I could say the stock market will make you wealthy. Mm. The shorter your time horizon, the more volatile, the more aware of the volatility you need to be. Right. Now, how does that work practically? Well, if you're young and you are working and you're investing as you should be and hopefully a significant amount of your income because it's not how much you make it's how much you keep that counts now you're looking as my daughter is as an example you're looking at decades which is the way to think about stocks mm -hmm. so absolutely that's long term and i say to her you should be investing in the total stock market index fund and put as much money as you can in it you shouldn't care even a little bit what the market's doing today or tomorrow. In fact, if anything, because you're adding money to it, you should be hoping it goes down. Anybody, any young person in our listening audience who is beginning to invest or is even 10, 20 years into it and has 40, 60 years to go should be hoping it crashes. Mm -hmm. So they're buying stuff on sale. Now, there's not a, a hard finish line either. You know, I'm in my 60s. I'm now drawing down on my portfolio, but I'm not selling it all at once. So I am still having a long-term horizon. I still want the long-term growth that the, uh, that the market can give me. Let's talk numbers. What reasonable returns can the average person expect if they stick with index funds and hold for the long term? I'd say, you know, if you go in at about 7-8%, over time, understanding that it's going to be much higher some years, much lower than other years, that's probably a reasonable number to use. My actual guess would be you will be pleasantly surprised at the end of 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, you certainly would have been if you'd done that in the mid-70s mid and, and came today. Okay. Well, so given that 8% seems to be a reasonable return over a long-term period of time, does it make sense for people who carry debts with less than an 8% interest rate, such as a mortgage or a car loan, does it make sense for them to pay those debts off early or to invest in the market? Well, I, I actually, yeah, I, that's a question that I, I get on a fairly regular basis on the blog. And, and I actually uh, have come up with sort of a little bit of a hierarchy and and I wouldn't go all the way up to 8% on, on your debts, but basically what I say is if you've got, if you, and, I, and by the way, I would not go out and borrow money to do this, right? Uh -huh. So I would not go out and borrow money with the objective of turning around and investing it in the market. But okay. if you're carrying debt, whether it's a mortgage or student loan or whatever, and your interest rate is 3% or less, I would hang on to that debt because rather than paying it off quickly, if you invested that in the market, Again, understanding that it's going to be a wild, volatile ride. Right. Over well, time, in inflation over time is 3%. Right. You will probably outperform that, that yeah. 3%. If you're between, if your interest rate is between, you know, between 3 and 5%, I would say it's kind of a personal preference. You know, if, if you're really anxious to be debt free, and uh, that speaks to my own personal psychology then there's nothing wrong with paying off your debt. And there's a lot right with it. And of course, that increases your cash flow going forward. Well, on the other hand, if you are a little more aggressive, 
you might say, you know, I've got this debt at at four and a half percent, and boy, looking at these historic averages, I will probably do better, then that's a possibility. I think once your debt starts getting over five, five and a half, six percent, I think at that point I'd pay it off because a a guaranteed six percent return is no small thing in this day and age. Hmm. And it's guaranteed and there's no volatility. Yeah, yeah. Can you can you explain that a little more? I mean, because if the historic evidence is so overwhelmingly positive about market returns, why? Yeah, and if eight percent is kind of a conservative long term projection of future returns, why would you pay off five percent or six percent interest rate debt? Well, because you get that five or six percent. So when you pay off debt. It's essentially whatever your interest rate is, is in essence, in a sense, a return on your investment, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have debt at 6% and you pay it off early, that's the equivalent of getting a 6% return on your money. Right. Now, the advantage of that is there's no volatility to that 6%. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons that stocks provide the handsome returns that they provide, you, know, you have to accept the idea that if you invest today, tomorrow might be a repeat of, of 2008, and you're going to have to suffer through that and hold on and keep investing to get the payoff a decade later. And that's a risk. So you get paid for taking that risk. You get paid for being willing to accept that volatility. Right. So it's looking at returns in context of risk. In context of volatility, right. So there's, and that's, this is an interesting thing too. So I, I cringe a little bit when I hear people say that stocks are risky. Um, I think the better way to, and that's the most common way to refer to them. I think the better terminology is stocks are more volatile than alternatives. So let me give you an example of what I mean. Okay. Let's say you have $100,000, and you put that $100,000 in an FDI-insured savings account at your local bank, and you'll get about 1% interest in this day and age, something around those lines. Most people in the financial world would say you have made a safe investment. (laughs) But now, what if I said to you, you know, let's look out 20 years, and in 20 years, I can guarantee you guarantee you that your $100,000 in the savings account will buy a fraction of what $100,000 today will buy. Right. The spending, the the power of that $100,000 will be vastly diminished, and that loss is guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Now which one's risky? Mm. So background for the listeners. Every index fund advocate I've ever encountered recommends diversifying. Every time you read or listen to somebody who talks about index fund investing, that's what you always hear. But Jim, you say put it all in the U.S. broad market. Why? Doesn't that make me refreshing? (laughs) It makes you intriguing. And you don't even recommend bonds. Why? Well, I I recommend bonds at a a certain stage in your life. Uh Uh-huh. So, and and your question covers a lot of ground. So... Uh In my world and in my stock series, if people read it, they will will hear me talk about sort of two stages of your life. And these are not necessarily related to your age. These are related more to your your cash flow from from your labor. So if you have a salary or a business or what have you. Trading time for money. Right. Trading time for money. So there is a wealth accumulation stage Mm -hmm. and there is a wealth preservation stage. So there is a time when you are building your wealth and there is a time when your wealth is supporting you. Right. So when your wealth is supporting you, and that might just be that you're taking a sabbatical in the middle of your career. Right. But when your wealth is supporting you, you're going to want to have some bonds to smooth the ride. And that's the function that bonds have. Okay. When you're working and building your wealth, your, your income, part of which, if you're smart, you're diverting into your investments, that that new money going into your investments plays that role of smoothing the ride. That's why I said earlier, if you're young and you're building your wealth, you want the market to crash. You want to be able to buy shares at lower prices. Right. So I do occasionally 
recommend bonds. I, I own bonds right now because that's the stage of life I'm in. Mm-hmm. But for people who are building their wealth, you're right. My recommendation is 100% stocks and specifically uh, if it's available and sometimes in your 401k it's not, but in a perfect right. world. Specifically, I like Vanguard and I like BTSAX, which is Vanguard's total stock market index fund. Right. Now, so why? Why not international fund exposure or small cap exposure? Well, let me, let me address both of those things, but let's first understand what we own when we own BTSAX. Okay. People say, well, gee, Jim, that's, you're not diversified. I say, au, au contraire, when I own VTSAX, I own a piece of every publicly traded company, virtually every publicly traded company, in the biggest economy in the world, the United States of America. That's about, last time I checked, 3,600 companies. 3,600 companies across all kinds of industries filled with people striving to compete in an unforgiving world where only the best survive. Those that fail will fall off the index. And those those companies that fail. Right. The companies that fail will fall off the index and be replaced by new blood. The companies, and the most you could possibly lose with a company that fails, and usually it falls off the index long before this, it would be 100% of your money. But the companies that succeed can grow by 100%, 200%, 2,000 percent. I mean, there's no limit to the upside. This is a process in looking at the total stock market index fund that I call self-cleansing. So those that fail drift away and those that are new and are replaced by new blood and that continually, those companies continually strive and grow. And that's why the stock market relentlessly marches upwards over time and will continue to do so as long as we have a viable economy. Right. So, yeah. So, certainly a total market index fund provides diversification, but it is tilted towards large caps as a, as a share. Right. So, let's look at the two things, the two why nots that you asked me. So, why not international? Why not small cap? Well, first of all, I don't have any great... If somebody came to me and said, you know, Jim, I, I really want international and I really want small cap, uh, I don't have any great... Uh, objection as long as you understand what you're really getting. So let's look at small cap first. Small caps typically over time outperform large cap stocks, but they do so with even greater volatility. And we already talked about earlier that one of the challenges to being a successful investor in the stock market is being able to stomach the volatility. If you're good with that, then if you want small cap, Go in with your eyes open, and and over 20 years, you will probably outperform a little bit. Now, international. Or before I go to international, do you have any questions on? Does that make sense or any? It does make sense. So it sounds like it's a behavioral. It's a behavioral recommendation rather than a mathematical one. Well, and to a certain extent, investing does become behavioral. So I can sit here and say mathematically, investing in stocks is the most powerful thing you can do with your money, uh, short of adding sweat equity into it with you know real estate, investing in flipping houses or something. But as a pure investing in stocks is the most powerful asset that we have. But you do have to adjust your psychology to the fact that it is a wild, volatile ride. And if you can't do that, if you are going to panic and flee the exits when it drops, and I guarantee you it will drop, on occasions and sometimes significantly. If you're not sure you can stomach that, if you're going to panic and flee when it happens, then you will hurt yourself. That's why part three in my stock series is most people lose money in the market. This is why. So when the market took its big crash back in in 08, 09, people were saying, well, you know, you look at Warren Buffett and, and you know, the, Warren Buffett didn't lose money in the, in the great stock market crash. Well, that's not entirely true. Warren Buffett's, the value of Warren Buffett's holdings in the stock market dropped just as dramatically as everybody else's did. I think at one point I looked at it and he was down $33 billion. And I was irritating my friends by walking around saying, gee, I wish I could be down $33 billion. (laughs) Because, of course, he was still worth about $25 or $30 billion at that point. The thing that Warren Buffett did that 
investors who actually lost money didn't do is he didn't sell. He didn't panic. In fact, he doubled up and, and invested, invested more. So that's the key thing. That's the psychological part. The math is sort of easy, but the volatility is a lot tougher to deal with than people think until they actually go through it. Well, then tell me about uh, international stocks. Would you, for the listeners who are wondering if, if they should put a slice of their portfolio into Europe or into emerging nations, what are your thoughts there? Well, you're right. I, I, my thinking on this runs counter to the vast majority of people who talk about this stuff, and I don't know, maybe even everybody. I think there are very few people who, who like I do, say you don't really need international. As I said, with in terms of small cap, if somebody came to me and said, you know, I really want international, I, I wouldn't fight them a lot. But here's why I don't think you need it, and here's why I don't hold it. Basically, I don't feel the need for international for three reasons. There's added risk with them, there's added expense, and we've already got international covered. Okay. So let's walk through those those three together. So what do I mean when I say that we have added risks? Well, when you invest internationally, you take on currency risk because international companies trade in the currency of their home country and currencies fluctuate against one another. So the U.S. dollar might rise or fall in relation to the currency of whatever international investment that you're, you're making. So there's an added dimension of currency risk. There's also an added dimension of accounting risks. So we have certainly in our country had companies like uh, Enron blow up through bad accounting procedures and, and not being transparent enough. But as we sit here today, for all of its shortcomings, the U.S. market is the most transparent in the world, which means that when you look at the numbers of the companies report in the U.S., they are the most transparent and the most reliable of any place in the world. The second thing is you have added expense. When you go to international funds, even Vanguard international funds, you're going to pay a, a much higher expense ratio. So those are the risks. But here's the really important thing to me is we've already got international covered. What do I mean by that? Well, as we already talked about, when you go into VTSAX, which is the total stock market index, it is weighted towards the largest companies in the country, in the U.S. So the top 500 companies are about 80%, if I remember, of that index. Those companies are almost all international businesses. Many of the largest generate 50% or more of their sales or profits overseas. Mm, so we're talking about companies like Google, Facebook, Nike, Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, companies that do a lot of overseas business. General Motors, Caterpillar, ExxonMobil. I'm not sure if ExxonMobil is a U.S. company. So you're right. I mean, most of, most every large U.S. company is, by definition, an international business. So I could go and invest in the local cola company in Africa, for instance, and I would take on those added accounting risks, the added currency risks, uh, the added expenses of buying an African fund that would invest in such a thing, or the transaction cost of doing it, or I can invest in Coca-Cola which is going to be in that market. And I can let Coca-Cola worry about the accounting risk. And I can let Coca-Cola worry about the currency risk. And they are better prepared than uh, individual investors or even or even mutual funds to deal with those, those risks. So we're going to wrap up. Jim, is there anything that you'd like to impart the listeners with? Any key lessons regarding either investing or creating financial independence? Well, in terms of creating financial independence, there's really three, three elements, and that is spend less than you earn, invest the surplus, and avoid debt. And if you do just those three things, you'll, you'll wind up rich, and you'll wind up rich not just in money. And if financial independence is your goal, the greater a percentage of your income you save and a greater percentage of your income that you invest the faster you'll get there. Some people see this as deprivation. I suggest that instead of deprivation, when you're saving and investing money, 
you think of it as just a different way to spend. But instead of spending it on a new car or a fancier house or a new wardrobe, you're choosing to spend it on your freedom. Huge thanks to Jim for coming on to the show. Jim just released a book called The Simple Path to Wealth, which includes a foreword by a blogger named Mr. Money Mustache, whom I know a lot of the listeners are familiar with. The book also includes a book blurb written by me. I I read it. I wrote a blurb praising it. So uh, we'll link to that book in the show notes if you're interested. You can access those notes at podcast.affordanything.com. That's right. We have a new website. So we are no longer at themoneyshow.co, which is where we used to live. We now are based at podcast.affordanything.com. That's where you can find show notes and everything else. And that actually is the perfect lead-in to this backstage report, the post-game wrap-up, the state of the show report. I want to start this by thanking you so much for sticking with this show throughout these messy last couple of weeks. As many of you know, my former co-host Jay Money left the show a few weeks ago, and since then I've been rethinking and reimagining what the show should look like with just me at the helm. And I feel like over the last few episodes, we have gone through a bit of a a messy, awkward little adolescent phase. Like, I feel a little bit like a 12-year-old, like, my voice is squeaking and I have all this acne. So thank you for all of your emails, tweets, downloads, shares, iTunes reviews, all the support that you've been sending me and sending this show throughout this messy transition. As I mentioned last week, this show is about the idea that you can afford anything, You just can't afford everything. So this is really a show about being ruthless when you make decisions about how you spend your money and your time and and your life because all of those are limited resources. Some of you want financial independence. That is a beautiful thing to achieve, and I hope that this show helps you achieve that. Some of you just want a life that's more you, a life where you're in control. And that's really what this show is all about. That's why we manage our money. At the end of the day, we're not managing our money because we like seeing numbers on a spreadsheet. Well, I mean, we do, but we're really using money as a tool to create the life we want. And that is what I hope this show can help facilitate. One of my goals with this future of the show is to expand the range of interview guests. I'd like to talk to psychologists, anthropologists, artists, inventors, scientists, authors. I want to talk to a lot of people from a lot of different fields about self-determination and living a more clear, controlled life. Obviously, I'm, I'm not going to lose the money tie-in. That's, those are the roots of the show and my blog and everything I write about and talk about and frankly think about. But I also want to make it very clear that, you know, this isn't just the money show. This is a show about your life. I mentioned in an earlier episode that I want to include more voices on the show. On the first Monday of the month, I feature an Ask Paula episode, which is the episode where I answer your questions. Now, I really enjoy doing the Ask Paula episodes. I I like taking your questions. And my hope is that at some point, I can start to do those more than once a month. That's a goal. But for the moment, you can expect to hear Ask Paula episodes on the first Monday of each month. If you would like to submit a question, please call and leave a voicemail. I would love to play your voice on the air. You can do that at affordanything.com forward slash voicemail. Again, that's affordanything.com slash voicemail. So that's it for this week's State of the Show Backstage Report. Next week is the first Monday of the month, so we'll be running an Ask Paula episode. I'll catch you next week. Till then. So today we have a real... Actually, let me start that over. (laughs) (laughs) So you know one of my favorite food combinations as of late? What? Is taking a spoonful of peanut butter, putting jelly on top, and then just eating that, like, by the spoon. Oh, that oh, that sounds so good. I've convinced myself that it's healthy because I've cut out the bread.
Did you enjoy this episode? Then grab our free ebook, Escape, by clicking on the cover here. You'll be taken to a page where you can enter your email for immediate access to everything you need to know about escaping the 9 to 5 grind to live life on your terms. And if you enjoyed this podcast, give us a like and subscribe with one simple click to get new episodes every Monday on your YouTube homepage.